Okay, do we have questions for the panelists? Okay, in the middle. Okay, so the question for those of you who couldn't hear was how did our participants transition back from their study abroad experience back into the college for their study now? Does anyone want to start? Everyone wants you to talk about your experience abroad in about four or five sentences, <laughs> which is impossible. It's, it's frustrating. You want to talk for a really long time, and, and, and that's not the way it works. <laughs> I guess, I mean, as soon as I got back, I was going to work at a neuroscience lab, which really had nothing to do with this or what I actually plan on doing with my life. But So I didn't really have a lot of time to think about it right away when I got back. But, you know, I guess throughout the year, I just tried really hard to see what I can do for the next year, next few years, to stay involved with anything Spanish-related. Yeah, I guess for me, uh, when we spent our time at the university in Dar es Salaam taking lots of coursework, it was kind of comparing um, the way we learned and were taught at that university with how I'm taught at Luther. And like there, a lot of the courses, like taking human evolution, basically the professor was really reading out the slides, like pretty point for point. Um, it was kind of hard to get a good class discussion, whereas at Luther, like a lot of the courses that I take, um, I'm able to like, engage in pretty deep discussions with my classmates. And just like getting used to that Western academics again was kind of, uh, there was a lagging period, you could say, so, yeah. Um, for me, I guess I didn't go through such a noticeable transition, but I did realize when I got back to the United States, we have a lot more space to work with, I guess. So a lot of the houses down in Costa Rica don't have like front yards and things like that. And so I had a different perspective on my transition. That was about it. I think for me, it was harder coming back than it was going to Tanzania. Um, and one thing was that everything was so clean here and like, Everyone was, my, like my family was making such a fuss over everything, I just wanted to chill out. But um, <laughs> I think um, having more space and time has let me process that more, and I think it's, that it wasn't an immediate thing where I just came back and like felt back at home, it's taken a while. Huh. For me, it was also about coming back, well, I mean, not also, well, yeah, also about coming back. Um, when I was in the Netherlands, I like, literally just traveled everywhere if I thought I could train. It was easier to travel around, whereas back in Minnesota, like, the weather is not helping me to bike around and I'm walking everywhere. So it's kind of limiting in terms of how much I go around, like travel around instead of just stuck in the bubble of college. So that's kind of frustrating, but getting used to it. Um, I think for me initially, I definitely experienced some reverse culture shock. I remember I was, I got stranded in Chicago um, because of a snowstorm and so my friend picked me up and she needed to go get a gift certificate at Victoria's Secret. So that was the first place I went when I was back in the United States and I was just like, what is this? Like, what is this? And I mean, just kind of dealing with those little things of just remembering American identity and these kinds of cultural influences we have here was was difficult, but I think in the long term, it's, I think studying abroad really gave me a really big sense of purpose for my career and my desire to really go into health. And I think the kind of projects I did when I was in India really kind of took the focus off, I think, what sometimes happens in like American pre-med culture of focusing on GPA and numbers and all this stuff to really looking more at what my goal is and like what these little steps will get me to in the end. So. Questions. Yeah, uh, my question was just about your research. I'm guessing for some of you it was the first time you had done a research project like this. What was that experience like? And did any of you end up doing more with that research afterwards? So did it become something you used in a thesis or or you plan on doing more with that? So the question was what it was like running their own research projects and then whether they plan to continue doing something or if they have already done something with that research. Um, I had 
done research before uh, in, at the University of Nebraska Med Center, but it was 100% different than doing research in India, especially in an independent setting. So I think um, something that I really had to learn was like a balance between persistence and patience when I was conducting my research of really being on top of it, really expressing uh, well how to, what I wanted and how this research needed to happen, but also being very patient in the fact that this is a culture that operates in a, at a much sl slower pace than America does. Um, so I think that was a really important adjustment and to realize that it didn't have to go according to my exact sk schedule and it would work out in the end. Um, and I guess I don't have future plans to use it necessarily, but I do really plan to go into medicine and continue connecting these, these ideas of wealth and, uh, and health. Um, for me, it wasn't my first research paper, but it was challenging in a way that I was using these like, numbers and quantifiable measures that I never really use. Um, but then at the end, I think it was more concrete to prove. And But it was a struggle for me to come up with a topic because I started with the issue of globalization. And where do I begin with that, you know? And this kind of brought me to think about what I want to do with this research after college, which is my passion and development, and I think it kind of gave me like a set stone of like what I want to do. Um, and I think I applied to internship positions with this topic um, using this knowledge I gained through the research and um, made me feel like I'm useful. So I think that's what I gained from the research. Uh, for me, it was the first research project that I did that was this big of a scale. Um, and it was tricky because I didn't have internet for a lot of the time and I didn't have a laptop um, when I was out doing research, so you had to handwrite everything and um, it was tough because we also weren't able to visit our field site before we got there, so um, you had to be very flexible in everything and um, one thing that I realized is that even though the project wasn't necessarily coming out to be the way that I wanted to, it was the way that it was and I kind of just had to deal with that at times. Um, but I think that I'm planning to use the information I got in the senior project next year. So, so for me, this was my first uh, research project. And I went to Costa Rica thinking that I would work really closely with an advisor who would just kind of guide me along the process. And what happened is my advisor left for Ecuador um, like two weeks <laughs> into the program. So I was just kind of stuck where I had to, to come up with everything by myself. And I think the experience was probably better for me just because I learned, you know, how to carry out this research um, on my own and I wasn't just waiting for him to hold my hand and show me the way. So that's kind of my experience with that. Yeah, for me too, I had never really done a research project like this before. Uh, as a biology major, I've spent a lot of time in the lab doing like organic chemistry kind of stuff. And I really wanted to try something else and to see what it would be like to do an anthropology research project. So like this was an exciting new opportunity uh, for me. And I think I grew a lot just struggling to find um, a topic that I thought I could actually use. And um, actually finding that questionnaire and like developing it and like um, finding like the food, the, the different food items available to the Maasai was like a really, really uh, challenging experience to me. But I'm really thankful for it uh, because of my research uh, part of my senior thesis is examining like how vitamin A is absorbed in, um, in like the intestines and uh, by other cells throughout the body. So that's kind of how it's um, related, how this current research is, is related to my senior paper. So, um, Well, I've done other projects before, but actually going to Costa Rica, I actually had the same advisor as Nick. And yeah, that was kind of frustrating that he just left. Um, but so that, that's kind of what made Costa Rica so much different, is that it was my, like, my project, and even if I wanted help, I don't, I mean, we had people around the program, but I didn't have like, my advisor right next to me to help me. Um, and although I'm not gonna necessarily use this specific research in the future, it did inspire me to actually want to go to grad school at some point, so I can still do international research with psychology. Um, I had done some research before, but not on the scale, and also not in a language that I'm learning. Um, this, this is something that uh, some of the presenters in the first group, group talked about, and we talked about it a little bit less, but like, um, 
doing research and conducting interviews in a language as you're as you're learning the language is hard. And uh, um, like my my French improved a lot over the course of the semester, but when I look back at like a transcript of an interview and like realize that I took like five minutes to ask this question, um, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, <laughs> um, but I don't know, I think I grew a lot also in terms of taking charge of my research and um, um, taking initiative, being, acting more independently, um, thinking about the questions that I wanted to ask and also just um, getting in touch with people. I also had an advisor who um, was, was helpful and uh, put me in touch with a lot of people and I owe her a lot for that but also kind of said, well, you got to do this yourself. So there's some moments where I'm sitting in front of the telephone realizing, well, i got to pick up the phone and call this person, ask um, them if I can interview them. Um, what are all the words that I'm going to say? <laughs> um, it forced me to learn how to take initiative in a way that I really hadn't before. As for using my research in the future, I'm definitely going to keep working with this um, in my senior thesis next year. And I think it also kind of revealed for me ways in which what I've been studying in the religion department um, in college uh, aren't things that are limited to academia. These aren't things that I can only explore in an academic setting, but things that really make a difference in people's lives, and, and that's something that I want to continue with as well. Other questions for our panelists? I have a question. This is for Leah. Um, I was wondering a little bit more about like the sewer system that maybe they had to work with, and what they're doing on the national and local government level. So how do they connect putting a toilet with having a sewer system? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say in general it's developing, but currently India only has the capacity to treat treat thirty percent of their wastewater, which I think really shows that a lot in a lot of ways the kind of improvements they are making are not necessarily sustainable. Um, I think there are there are huge improvements, and the one of the Millennium Development Goals has been to increase sanitation coverage, um, but. Interestingly, India is one of the countries that's lagging behind the most um, in, in a global sense of countries that are gaining sanitation. Um, I think a lot of times, um, it's, and it's really interesting, in India it's going really state by state in terms of who's improving sanitation. And I think it comes really a lot from this kind of topic I was talking about of education and the kind of areas that are increasing awareness and really making this one of their platform ideals uh, within their local governments are the ones who are changing rapidly. But there are some states in India that have made almost no improvement in the last 20 years. This is from Michelle. Um, in your explorations of urban differences, did you find or look at Okay, so the question for Michelle was in dealing with her Maasai informants, whether they had different, felt themselves to have different identities while they were wearing different types of clothing. Um, I definitely think some people did, um, especially people who. That's a question. Because there were different, different attitudes on it. Um, the translators that I worked with, one interesting story is that um, this woman, she graduated um, all of her education. She went through primary school and secondary school. Um, and then she graduated. And then to show everyone that she was um, still could be educated and be Maasai, she wore her traditional clothing to her graduation um, to kind of prove everyone that she could be both. Um, and so I think that some people have really internalized the ideas of, you know, maybe it is stigmatized, but for some people it's more of a way to prove that they can be both and a way to not rebel, but um, to prove themselves. So I think it differs, but um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about it too much. I 
guess I would be curious to turn the question around and ask you guys if you're wearing what you normally wear to class. And if not, <laughs> do you feel different? And I should point out that I wear a bow tie every day to class, and today I'm not wearing it. So I'll let you guys figure out what you think about that. <laughs> OK, other questions? Okay, over here, Shay. I was actually going to ask a question to Michelle as well. So um, I and just brief, but um, did you notice a difference? Or did you did notice a difference um, in how often they wore side clothes versus Western based on their gender? Like, did you come up with it? Did you kind of see any, anything uh, indicated that one gender wore one more? So the question is whether or not people wore were more likely to wear used clothes or traditional <laughs> side clothes depending on their gender. Yeah, that is something I was really interested in, but I kind of ran out of time with my project. Um, but one interesting thing was that um, a lot of women would wear their Maasai clothes as a kind of cultural marketing. Um, so they would stand on the side of roads trying to flag down tourist vehicles. Um, and one way to do this was by wearing the traditional clothes. Um, and for men, I think it was, since they were working more in town most of the time, they were wearing more Western clothes. Um, so there were gender differences, but it wasn't something that um, I had enough time to explore. I think that'd be something I'd suggest for further research. Other questions? So Nick mentioned uh, having to adjust his uh, research project once once he got to Costa Rica and, and finding out it wouldn't quite, it quite work. And, and I'm curious for everybody, the ways in which you had to adjust your, your research project when you got on the ground and were, were doing it there, and what kind of advice you'd give to students going off campus to do research projects, uh, um, the, the kind of flexibility uh, or, or the things they need to take into account uh, that you had to learn for yourselves. So the question here in the front was practical advice that any of our participants could give to other students who are going to go do research. What did they learn that they would impart to others? That maybe Anyone want to start? Sure. So I guess my piece of advice would be to be absolutely sure of what you want to study before you leave for your field site. Because I had a general idea and I had done a little bit of previous literature review, but I hadn't done it specifically about Yano Bonito or like anywhere in Costa Rica really. And so that's probably uh, the problem that I have is Fair trade might be good in other places, but it wasn't specifically good in Costa Rica. So, um, yeah, just make sure you know what you want to do, exactly what you want to do. And I guess, like, add to that is at the same time, know exactly what you'd want to do, but if you can't narrow it down to something exact, make sure you know what your strong passion is going to be when you go down there. Because if you have to be flexible, at least you're going to still have the opportunity to study what you really, really want to study before going down there. I guess I really liked your comment about know what you're passionate about because um, I did two research projects when I was in India. And my first one, I showed up and I went from researching diabetes to researching social stigma of leprosy to researching iron deficiency in pregnant women in a week. So, I mean, it was, you know, I was, it was just something that I, at least the way my program was structured, you just had to go with an idea and be able to present yourself well and be completely okay if they shut you down and tell you you have to do something completely different. And I think, but just the fact that like all three of those, my focus on, even from going from all three of those, my focus was still on kind of the social determinants of health and what the true story was behind people with these kinds of disorders in terms of their socio-demographic status. So I think really narrowing down like what you're interested in um, and being flexible for whatever topic that can fit into. Other questions? Okay, if not, then we need to work out our group photo, so. All right.